Today, we're going to talk about a very complicated subject that has taken me months to figure out how to put it into words. And no matter how this video comes out in the end, it still will not be perfect or the best way to talk about this, but it needs to be talked about and I want to talk about it. Today, I wanna to talk about shamanism or shamanic practice, because this is something that has become very important to me over the last couple of years. And I definitely use shamanic techniques within my ritual practice. But there is such a rich and long history to what is under the term shamanism that it's really hard to even think about getting into one video. So this is probably going to be a multiple video series, depending on how much I'm able to cram into this one video here. But my objective is to give you an introduction into shamanism, to describe what it is, give you the basics, and then maybe how it can help you within your own personal and spiritual practice, but also just to start the conversation because, again, this is going to be an ongoing conversation probably for years to come. So as I hinted, the history of shamanism goes back for t over 10,000 years. The oldest recorded shaman or someone that would be known as a shaman uh, for a culture goes all the way back to like, I think 10,000 BCE. And then cultures across the world have had shamanic practices or things that we would call shamanic practices, and they of course would call it something different. But a lot of these cultures and tribes have come to the same conclusions, which is why someone named Michael Harner uh, started researching these tribes and shamanic practices in the 1970s, and Michael Harner developed what is known as core shamanism. And core shamanism is what most people are going to learn, because then there is also traditional shamanism. But first, we need to actually talk about the difference between a shaman and, and shamanism. And then of course, there's all kinds of different techniques and all these things it's complicated but I'm not alone in this video and in this conversation I reached out to Spirit of Wolf a shamanic organization that is all across Europe and up into Siberia and is starting to spread around here in the United States so I got a couple people from there Miriam and Anthony to talk with me in an interview to answer some of the basic questions about shamanism but first I want them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about Spirit of Wolf so my birth name is Miriam, and uh, my shamanic name uh, being given by my teacher is Easy Dear Come or Easy Dear Come. Uh, not like easy, but you write like uh, I, Z, uh, I and H. And um, yeah, I work uh, now as a shaman and I have been an educated uh, psychologist and uh, I combine those things in my, uh, we call it the wolf cave, <laughs> um, my practice here in Holland. And I am Anthony. Um, I have yet to receive my shamanic title because I have not been initiated in Spirit of Wolf. But uh, on Instagram, you can find me as Wolfpack Healer. Um, I've been a shamanic practitioner for four to five years right now. And earlier this year, I joined Spirit of Wolf. Other than being a shamanic practitioner, I work a lot with people as a barber. And that helps me understand the human psyche a little bit more because it's not really hairdressing or barbering when you have very uh, personal talks with your clients. And I work one-on-one, -on -one, so that gives me plenty of room to, to, be, to go deep on certain subjects. And um, so I add a little bit of a shamanic flair to my work as a barber too. Um, so to kind of just roll off of the, uh, that into another question, uh, can you describe uh, Spirit Wolf Shaman uh, and just like, uh, you know, the organization around that and just give us an introduction to what the group is? Yes, um, the Spirit of Wolf is actually a tradition from um, Kakasia or Kakas. This is a republic in uh, Siberia and it's between, uh, squeezed in between the Altai and Tuva. And um, this tradition is a, a family tradition of uh, shaman Karagai and uh, Karagai uh, now lives in Moscow and um, he founded an organization around his family tradition called Spirit of Wolf I believe if I say this right in 2010 and uh, this quickly became very popular because uh, shaman Karagai is very famous in uh, Siberia famous like uh, he did miraculous healings and he's a very known uh, well-known shaman in Russia and he made this organization and community around Spirit of Wolf also for preservation of uh, shamanic heritage uh, and also to help and heal people. And his um, family tradition was also, um, they took in Shaman Morsuk, 
maybe some of you who are listening uh, also follow him on Instagram, Shama Morsuk. And he is my teacher, and so I learned from him. And um, the whole organization is now um, given to him, and he lives in Austria, and is given to him, and he now coordinates this in Europe. And uh, so the wolf has entered Europe, and uh, this is basically very short where we are now. If you can't tell, this is not going to be a short video. There's no way to condense all this together. Um, but this conversation I had with Anthony and Miriam uh, lasted for over an hour and a half. And that entire interview will be available either on podcast form or video form. We're still kind of trying to figure that out, uh, both on the Wisdom of Odin uh, and on their podcast as well. And so if you want to listen to that full conversation, it will be available to you. But I definitely try to take the highlights of that and bring it to this video. And so really the first thing here I want to make sure I specify as well and that they saw as very important and I see as important is the difference between a shaman and shamanic practice or shamanism. And so a shaman is someone who actually has the role of a shaman within a community whose job and profession it is to heal people, to help people, to use what they've learned from another shaman that trained them in order to do these things. And so someone who is actually a practicing shaman, is it is their profession, it is a career. Uh, whereas someone who uses shamanism or shamanic practice like myself learns from shamanism, typically core shamanism, in order to enrich their lives, in order to get connected more to their spirituality, perhaps to their gods. And so it's just one of those things where, uh, you know, the terminology is very difficult and, you know, and I wish it was a lot easier. I like to boil things down to simplicity, but it's not that simple. Um, but yes, really you have the shamans that are, you know, should be highly respected. It's a craft. It's something that takes years and years of training. It's something that is orally passed down. It's going to be different from each tradition. And then you have shamanic practice, which is more than likely what you'll be watching this video for. So just as I have in the past with other subjects, I've broken this down into categories of who, what, why, where, and how, and answering these questions, I think, uh, to make this a little bit easier of a conversation. And then we'll kind of cover some things that I know a lot of people will have questions about. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, there's timestamps down below. But first, we're going to cover what is shamanism? Shamanism now has two ways one of the practicing of the techniques and the other is the shaman and the shaman traditionally is the one that does uh, healing he's also a priest uh, he's a storyteller a doctor uh, a psychologist and he also performs marriages and is involved in death birth and everything else that involved in the community shamanism for me is um exactly as Miriam said, divided in those who practice, who practice it and those who are a shaman, um, in which the role of the shaman is the healer, the psychologist, the doctor, the one who tells you the things you have in your head but don't know how to listen to. And I must add that the most important thing in shamanism is that you have the connection to the spirit world. <laughs> I was just going to say that. I'm oh, sorry. And <laughs> uh, the one that connects with spirit. <laughs> you said it first. <laughs> that should be, be the first thing that we should have said, but it's yeah. just so obvious that uh, it's so hard yeah. to explain this when you're fully into this. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, answering the question of what is shamanism is complicated. It's a big question because it's many different things to many different people and many different people groups. But as we've mentioned before and as we've talked about quite a bit already, Michael Harner is probably the one most people are going to go with right away. The Way of the Shaman was written quite a long time ago and the research done in this was, you know, of course, quite a long time ago as well. And it does have importance. It may sound like we're negative towards core shamanism uh, and it's not inherently a, a negative thing. It just needs to be understood that there's so much more to shamanism than just core shamanism written by Michael Harner. In fact, I think Miriam puts it best in the way she describes her relationship with core shamanism. It's like what you say, um, core shamanism takes the core from everything around the world. And um, Michael Harner tried to uh, find all the similarities around the world. So he said like every um, shamanic tradition around the world uses trance, for example. I just say something, the one uses trance. Uh, induced by uh, plants, the other does it by uh, the drum, uh, etc. So he says one component of shamanism, of the core of shamanism, is the trance. So this is the way he, uh, how I perceive it, or how, how I uh, have understood it. 
um, that he wanted to get some to the core of what real shamanism, what, what shamanism was and is, and um, to make, I believe, it's, it's not a bad starting point for us here without any tradition, without any shamanic tradition, because in the, I believe in the late 70s or 60s, a lot of Native American uh, rituals came to the West and uh, the Native American elders, they said like, you uh, in the West have lost your shamanic tradition and we want to help you and you can use our rituals, our sacred rituals. So uh, this was actually, I believe, a good starting point because there's a whole tradition. It's like a full tradition and Michael Harness core shamanism um, is of course not an existing tradition. So he made a system to be uh, to be clear. And um, this system, I think it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not, it's very, it's very good actually. And uh, I've seen good results to up a certain point um, for people to learn shamanism as, as do I have learned it, as do all of us probably have learned yeah. core shamanism through books of Sandra Ingerman. And those are very good books and they're absolutely not bad. And I have no criticism about them whatsoever. Like I said, everything's welcome in this world, which is deprived of their connection to nature, you know, so everything's welcome. But if you, um, if you want to bring a local aspect in, uh, I would prefer that more. And um, what's the difference? Well, yeah, well, local tradition, like uh, heathenry is very local. It's, it's, it connects with the plants, with the animals, with the uh, uh, climate that is in a certain area. And it also connects with the ancestors. So the traditions that your ancestors have uh, practiced as well. So this makes up a broken line. So this, uh, the hope is of course, that we can reconnect this line. And so people try to uh, combine this core shamanism with research, research into old tradition and, and deities and all that kind of stuff. So they almost use um, core shamanism as like a base to build off of. Yeah, like a basis. Yeah, yeah, and that's not a bad idea. I think that's a good idea, actually, to, to start fresh. And if there is no other option or alternative, this is the best way I think you can reconstruct your tradition, your shamanic tradition. But it's not... Um, well, in, in fact, it's now a tradition. It's a tradition of Michael Harner. So when you learn from Michael Harner, it's a tradition of Michael Harner, Harner tradition, you can call it this way. So I believe, yeah, this is a tradition, core shamanic tradition. So I'd like to how she described it as Michael Harner's version of shamanism, his tradition of shamanism. Uh, but I think it's important to note that there are many books that are very similar to Michael Harner's work as well. So this is another one I picked up by Paul Francis, uh, and it's just called The Shamanic Journey. And there's several books in the series. And again, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I learned a few things from this book. It has some techniques that may help you out. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's very similar to Michael Harner's work. And so I think a lot of the books you're going to find are going to be more similar to this than anything else. But when it comes to specific information about shamanism and the tribes and cultures that have practiced them, I can only say go to those cultures and tribes then. If they want to share their shamanic practice with people from the outside, I think that is perfectly fine and wonderful, but I think it's ultimately up to them because this is a very sacred thing. Now, luckily Spirit of Wolf, you know, this is a Siberian tradition, but it has spread globally. And so I really respect this way of thinking, how they're sharing these sacred traditions and rituals with people around the world. And I really, really respect that. Now, when it comes to the Nordic perspective here, for the people that, you know, watch the Wisdom of Odin for uh, Norse paganism, this is when it gets really complicated because Norse paganism and shamanism really don't have much of a link outside of vulva work or sather work. Now, there's not many books about Nordic shamanism, and most of them are written by the same person, which is Evelyn Reisdyke. Reisdyke, I believe is how you pronounce her name. And I have one of her books here on a physical copy, which is just called Spirit Walking. Now, this one isn't particularly about Nordic paganism, but she has another one that I have on Kindle called The Norse Shaman. And so these books are very similar in ways, and they, uh, they go off of each other. So clearly, she took a lot of her uh, writings from Spirit Walking, which I think is a good book, and then transitioned it over to Norse Shaman or vice versa. But they're very similar. Uh, but Norse Shaman does focus on on what we know historically about Nordic shamanism or what would be called Nordic shamanism or would be called Nordic spirit walking. And I think that's a, another key term here is spirit walking is a term you'll see a lot for shamanic practice as well. Um, so as far as the Norse shaman goes, it does focus a lot on what we know about vulvas as well as say their practice. Um, a lot of this comes from archeological evidence, uh, which we'll talk about more later when we get to spiritual garb and wear. Uh, so she really tries to reconstruct off of very little 
little information what a vulva sather practice would be. Now, again, when it comes to these things, you know, if, when, I saw, when I went to Denmark and I went to the Reba Viking Center, there were, very clearly was, you know, pagan stuff happening there, magic work happening. And when I talked to the people there in Denmark, they said, oh, there's a vulva that lives here. And so I tried to get in contact with her, but I, I couldn't seem to get a hold of her. Uh, she was one of those that definitely doesn't have a lot of social media. And I think that's a common thing when it comes to Shemitic practice as well, is it's hard as the, to, to transcend the internet because a lot of the people that practice this really stay away from the internet. Uh, and so, so yeah, it can be hard to learn more because of this, but you know, uh, it's just, it, it's complicated. But yeah, you know, in conclusion, as far as Nordic shamanism, it's really hard to say. Uh, you know, more than likely they had this kind of practice because the majority of cultures had some form of spirit working practice, spirit walking practice that we now would call shamanism in the lump term. But again, it's just hard to say. Uh, the same goes for the Druids and the Celtic uh, belief system, the Celtic paganism. Uh, if you haven't already, the Celtic paganism video will cover this in much more detail how complicated Celtic paganism is. But the Druids themselves would fulfill a shamanic type role as they were the spiritual advisors. Uh, they helped with rituals. They, you know, they were also the medicine men. They were the people that healed. And so they fulfilled a lot of the role of what shamans fill, but they would be called Druids and what they do would be called Druidism. Uh, and so it just, it gets really complicated. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, again, it just it's really complicated here, but you know, it can be really hard to find specific Norse things when it comes to shamanism. Uh, and so that's why, you know, you know, someone like me, I look at what we understand from Norse paganism and then look at, uh, you know, core shamanism and try to draw those conclusions. And just as Miriam said, a core shamanism can be a good foundation to build your own practice off of. Uh, so yeah, it's just shamanism to me is a very personal experience that can be shared with others, but requires an incredible amount of spiritual honesty between people. Now, we already talked about this a little bit with Nordic paganism and how that kind of goes into shamanism, uh, but I did ask Miriam and Anthony what they thought the who was of shamanism. So who are involved in uh, the practice of shamanism? Of course, you yourself, and uh, you in connection with the spirits means the spirits of nature, the elements, the sun, the moon, the earth, the sky, the ancestors, uh, and uh, all other beings that you don't know now how they would look like or how they're named, but you will probably meet some. So in the uh, spirit of wolf tradition, is there any like de this like set deities? Does it follow like a deity path or is it more of like focus on the, the actual practice of it? Uh, well, we, we don't have deities. Uh, we do have, we do uh, well, have we, um, Get them, get them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <so, laughs> we do have de we do have deities, um, but it's it's not in the same form as um, the Norse structure. We have Father Sky, we have Mother Earth, we have uh, apparently a god from the Middle World that I learned yesterday about. Um, yeah, uh, and then you have the god from the Middle World. Or one of the gods from the middle world who is uh Kayurakan. Uh he was uh, a bear and he was actually the first one who gave um the the tambourine or the drum to uh the first shaman. So the thing I like here is like, again, this is one of those things, especially with core shamanism and world, global religious beliefs, is you see these uh, lines, you know, come together in the sense of the ancestors being an important component, you know, there being higher beings that do have importance and connection to us, you know, the, the most simple of them being sun, moon, earth you know, and, and then getting more complicated from there. But then also the idea of spirits. Spirits is, I think, the common ground that anyone that practices shamanism will find. And the more I learn about, you know, uh, paganism and how it's evolved in cultures who have not been removed from their pagan belief systems, that's more or less how it is seen. It's this animistic idea of us living in unity with the spiritual world around us. Now, a couple of, you know, cleanup questions here because of the when and the where of shamanism and where you practice it. You know, these are just kind of simple questions, but I thought maybe they would help you out. Uh, it depends on tradition uh, and it depends on your own needs and uh, the way in shamanism that you've chosen. Um, but we in Spirit of Wolf, we are active during several calendar days when we honor the elements and they have special days. We honor the equinoxes and the solstices and we make ritual during the new and full moon to ride on this flow of energy of rise and fall and rise and fall again.
preferably in nature, but we are living in 2022 in which we have more plants than we have children. So you can connect with those, but also in your homes, uh, these, these have spirits too. They care for you. They will look out for you. They will bring fortune for you if you treat them well. Um, and you can actually just do it everywhere. If you find a nice rock on the street, you just grab it, sit down with it, have a little talk with it. If it doesn't say anything, that's perfect too, but at least you have a nice, lock, nice rock. Now, as far as me, you know me, I'm the outside guy. I prefer to do things outside, but I will say when I was just getting started with shamanic practicing, with trance work, with spirit walking, I did it in my house because I didn't feel comfortable going outside and doing it. But at the end of the day, it is about nature. It's about feeling more connected to everything, about the life's that exists all around us, about the trees, about the grass, about the bugs. And so I do like to do it outside when I can, but of course finding a space for it isn't always possible, especially if you're using a drum. But right here, I think I found the perfect space for it. It's a grove with a three triple tree growing in the center. And so of course I'm like, this is a perfect spot and there's no one here. And so, uh, yeah, I might do a little something out here, we'll see. But yeah, as far as the where, it really is up to you where you feel the most comfortable. Uh, but ultimately, it can be done anywhere. But just remember, it is a nature-based thing. So I highly recommend doing it outside. Now, this next question is going to be the big one. And I, I, uh, you know, I love asking this one to uh, Miriam and Anthony to see their answers. But it's the question of why practice shamanism? Yeah, why would someone practice shamanism? Um, it brings you more into contact with nature, with your own soul or spirit whatever you may call it um, brings you more in touch with your feelings and can bring you a deep rest and connection with the world around you yourself and others one should practice one should practice shamanism for its own benefits um, for mental health for physical health for spiritual health um, to learn to know yourself better in many levels. Uh, for me, it was a lifesaver. And I'm sure it was for many people and will be for many people. Um, the intense and beautiful bond you create with yourself and the spirits that are around you, that's just worth it for, for me. Now, obviously this answer is going to be slightly different depending on if you want to be a shaman or if you want to practice shamanism being a shaman is going you know and wanting to be a shaman is going to be very different uh than someone that wants to practice shamanism and so for me personally as someone that just wants to practice shamanism that wants to use these techniques to enrich my spiritual practice and and, and connect more with the gods uh you know to me it is just deep in my ritual practice because ritual is one of the most important things to me when it comes to uh how i communicate with the gods and and how i communicate with the spirits and so using these shamanic techniques of drumming of singing of dancing have enriched the way i connect to the energies around me and so that's why shamanism is important to me and why i practice it so now that we kind of really covered an introduction into what shamanism is and the different components of shamanism uh we need to talk about the actual techniques of shamanism so the three i was taught in the beginning at least from the books i read were drugs drums and dancing with the three techniques now obviously one of these i consider more of a crutch because it's an easy way you take some drugs and you can have a spiritual trip. The technique comes in when you're just using drums and dancing or singing to enter a trance-like state. But first off, really, what is a trance state? So trance isn't quite a meditative state. Meditation's more about clearing your mind, where a trance is more about going on a journey, having a destination. And, and this is really where the belief in the spirit world comes into play, uh, because this is what you're interacting with. When you're going into a trance, you're, you're interacting with the spirit world. Now, there are so many different varieties of trance out there. So, uh, you know, there, of course, is like a hypnosis trance where, you know, someone's kind of guiding you through it. Uh, and typically, when you get started with trance, you want a guided trance. You want someone guiding you through it, uh, someone else playing the drums. Um, and it actually takes quite a lot of work and 
practice to get to the point where you can drum and get yourself into a trance, and this took me a long time as well. So I highly recommend finding a playlist um, of a trance music. There's plenty of them out there. Um, I've used them in the past. Um, you have to find what works for you. Uh, and I know whenever we've had these guided meditations at our, uh, our retreats, at our gatherings as a community, we have music as well to help people uh, kind of get into that state. But when it comes to the actual ritual environments, we rely very heavily on drums. Um, so drums are the quintessential way to get into a trance. Now, these are not used necessarily by every shamanic uh, group out there, by every tradition. In fact, when it comes to the northern shamans, the Nordic shamans, we have no evidence of them using drums to achieve trance-like states. They did have some form of uh, like vulva staff or a sather staff that we know existed that was used in some form of ritual manner, uh, but drums we don't know definitively if they used. In fact, we don't know a lot about Northern shamanism. Um, if you want to learn more, check out that book I recommended, Norse Shaman. So yeah, drums are to me the best way, the best way to get into it right away, uh, to get into a trance state. So look for a playlist. Um, you know, I definitely recommend picking one up yourself and, and getting used to drumming for a very long time. Uh, and I guess, you know, the science behind it, there is science behind trance-like states, is when you, you know, have a shamanic beat, of, you know, uh, a certain amount of beats, it alters your brain chemistry and puts you in a different mindset. And, and it's pretty crazy once you actually get there. And so again, like drugs can get you there like on their own, you don't need anything else. But it is pretty incredible when you can use uh, drums to get to that state. Now, dancing and singing um, are something that uh, kind of go hand in hand with that. That's something that you want to add more layers to. And this is why uh, shamanic techniques, um, you know, shamanism takes years to learn, if not a lifetime, if not multiple lifetimes. Um, that's why it's passed down between shaman to shaman. Um, is because there are so many techniques that you can master to achieve, um, you know, what you want to, to achieve those spirit walking moments. Uh, and so it, there's a lot of trust here when you get into a shamanic trance um, about what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, and, and really uh, shamanism in general, especially for shamans, uh, like actually working shamans, uh, you know, there's a lot of trust involved because when you interact with the spirit world, you know, you're the one seeing it, you're the one experiencing it and then bringing it back to others and, and using those effects and using what you see to help others and guide others as well. So there's a huge amount of trust when it comes to shamanic practice. And, you know, and that's one of the reasons it's really hard to talk about. Uh, just rolling into that question uh, is, you know, can you describe a, uh, you know, spirit of wolf shaman ritual? <laughs> You're the teacher. <laughs> uh, there's no such thing as a spirit of wolf typical ritual, but um, one of the main uh, rituals that you also find not only in our tradition, but also in Tuva and other places of Siberia is the Kamlani ritual. Uh, which uh, followers of mine or Anthony have also seen uh, coming on our up on our Instagrams and um, this is like a, a very ancient and basic sort of shamanic format for a ritual and um, the Kamlani is a fire ritual in which there is uh, of course a fire and um, this fire well, the Kamlani Kam is means shaman, so uh, this for first and foremost. And Kamlani basically means something like the shaman communicates with his spirits, and that's basically it. And um, the Kamlani is uh, for the shaman to be the mediator in this ritual. So there can be uh, people involved for healing, there can be a blessing, there can be a wedding, there can be a celebration, it can be an, uh, a transfer of power or an initiation, but this uh, ritual is like uh, a very well-known ritual across the whole Eurasian continent. And uh, of course this goes uh, together with several um, other actions, not only making the fire, but the fire is made uh, or built in a specific way. And this way corresponds uh, with the goal of the ritual. So is it a blessing? We make another uh, fire or we build it in another way than we would if we would do an extraction ritual or, or how we would say or a sort of exorcism ritual. And um, um, the, the, the thing is that is uh, pretty interesting for the listen listeners is that um, how I was taught shamanism is mostly inwards. So 
uh, when we contact the spirits, we, we close ourselves off from the external world and we go inside. And you see everywhere these images that people lie on the floor and doing trance uh, journeys. And these trans journeys are very popular. You see them everywhere. And again, that is not a criticism or anything. It's perfect. Uh, but a difference is that the Kamlani is very active. So uh, we create a ritual space. There is a fire and the shaman has uh, his ton, his uh, shamanic costume or coat. He has his on and he has his drum and he goes clockwise or against the clock, or, but mostly clockwise around the fire with his drum. So he is very active. And of course, the shaman is known as the... Um, a person who goes into ecstasy, ecstasy, and he, he, um, he or she, of course, but I use he now. Um, he invites the spirits into this place, into this field. So the spirits are actually there and can touch you, and you can see them, and they can do stuff with the fire, and they do stuff with the wind, and. Um, this is, of course, very different than the trans journeys in which we travel to another place. And the Kamlani is like we invite them to come with us and be with us. So this is an important, uh, I think, an important distinction between what we maybe are used to here in the West. So for me, a basic shamanic ritual involves a drum. <laughs> so that's a really basic one. And if you actually look at uh, all these books I've recommended throughout this, have a lot of beginner techniques I, I recommend. A lot of them are very simple, just simple journeys, uh, simple conversations with spirits and, and things like that. Uh, but I, you know, I would say like the first one, which is a really good one, is just like a gratitude one. Uh, this is the first one I learned, uh, is just going into a shamanic trance and then just saying to the, the realms that we're in now, the middle realm, you know, thank you. Thank you for everything. Thanking the spirits that are around you for every lesson they teach you. Um, it's, it's a really wholesome and great way to connect with them. Uh, and then once you've connected here in the middle realm, it's a lot easier to, to start exploring elsewhere because the middle realm is what exists now. I mean, it's this tree right next to me. It's this valley. It's this clouds above me. You know, all the spirits that exist around me, that's the middle realm. So it's more tangible. Uh, but when it comes to things such as the upper realm and, you know, what is above us uh, and connecting to deities and, and higher beings, it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, and then actually going down and uh, talking with the ancestors and primal spirits, uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, so there's so many layers to this and, and, and all things I can't cover in an introduction video. But this idea of going up and down the world tree, uh, going up down, and down the tree or upper and lower and middle realms and all those things, that is kind of the core thing that you're trying to do with a shamanic ritual. Uh, there is one more subject I want to cover before we end the video because I think this is going to be one that people are really interested in. And that is ritual clothing because I, I think this is something people uh, fixate on really quickly. Uh, and so I want to make sure we cover it. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about ritual clothing or spiritual garb when it comes to shamanic practice. So hey, it's me again back at the Sacred Grove that I was discussing earlier, and we're getting to the section of this video talking about ritual clothing. So before we dive too deeply into that, and I'll share with you Miriam's and Anthony's answer, and talk about my own experiences with ritual clothing, I want to say that I see a lot of people, they focus on this too much. As soon as they get into shamanic practice, they want to get the clothing right away. This should be a natural progression. It shouldn't be, I, I really truly believe it shouldn't be something that you're like, okay, I need to buy all the clothes so I can fit the part. I think that is too common we see across a lot of facets of life, of people that want to get into hiking and buy all the hiking clothes but never go hiking. The people that want to get into working out or you know going to the gym more, they buy all the athletic clothes and they don't actually work out. And so this is something that's just a human condition. And it's the same with shamanic practice. Truly, in my mind, what you need is a way to get into the trance. That is one of the most important aspects to me of sh uh, shamanic practice. And so buying a drum, making a drum, that is where you want to start. The clothing, the wear, it'll all come in time. Again, we'll share with you where this clothing comes from, where I've kind of discovered it in my own path, and of course, where the spirit of wolf tradition comes in. So if you want to get into shamanic practice for the first time, what I truly believe you need to pick up before the visor, before the headdress, before the robes, before the necklaces, before anything else, is a drum. Um, well, the, the ton or the shamanic costume, um, like 
is hanging behind me and Miriam. Um, it contains a few parts. You have the shamanic crown or headdress, uh, which is set upon the head. And you have the tongue, which is the, the vestment that you're wearing. Um, it's like a robe, but um, a little bit different. Uh, this, first and foremost, it brings protection. It brings protection to, to ourselves, but also to the people around us, especially if we're hosting uh, a ritual where other people are included. The iron that are hanging, the snakes that are hanging from uh, Izzy's um, shamanic costume, these are spirits that are actually helping her along her path uh, in the rituals, but also in healing work and in, uh, if I can correct about this, daily life. Um, and they add, it, it's, it's like having a personal army with you that will help you, um, that will help you with healings, with guiding, with calling in the right spirits so that nobody gets like um, bad experiences. Um, and the, like you said, was correct. Um, the ton, as we call it, is um, the snakes are indeed uh, Iren, as we, we call it. And Iren is basically a spirit house or a spirit um, doll or whatever name or amulet or something that contains a spirit. And these snakes are given by initiation. So this is a very big difference between the, um, um, the ritual garment that you see who also other people from traditions are wearing who are not initiated. Uh, and this is your proof of initiation. So you don't need anything to, uh, if I go to Siberia and I come like this, they, they see you are shaman within the tradition because this is what you get when you are initiated. And the snakes are also power from the underworld. Uh, but this is a very large topic that I cannot uh, explain fully right now. Uh, it's indeed an armor. And um, it's, of course, very personal. Um, in Spirit of Wolf, this, uh, the ton, the, the coat is very personal. Um, because we are very non-dogmatic. Because it's very free and it's very authentic connection to nature. Uh, for example, in uh, Buryat. Uh, tradition, you see that the shamans often wear the same um, garment or the same uh, uh, dress. And um, on the head is always feathers, because if no feathers, then the shaman cannot fly to the other worlds. This is the, the thought of it. And uh, we also have some very traditional uh, places there uh, where you place some things. And this has to do with the cosmology. For example, um, here, this is uh, the sun, representation for spirit of the sun. And this is on the right side, because we see sun as male. And the right side of the body is also male. And the moon is on the left side on the back, because the sun is consciousness, and that we can see with the light of the sun. And the moon is dark and is unconscious and subconscious. So this is on the back for, for just an example. And uh, students uh, of Spirit of Wolf who have not yet been initiated, they all make this costume. Um, but this costume is not important for if you just do shamanism. Most of the people who start with shamanism in our tradition are called white shamans. And they work with spirits of the upper world. And we see this as, as spirits that are helpful and that are um, not so much dangerous. And you have the black shaman who works mostly with the underworld spirits and also is very much involved in healing. So um, this is more important to have more protection, but it's also it's of course most important that you start with the easy things and the, the good things and the uh, good is not a good um, uh, word for it, but uh, the helpful spirits before you go to the harmful spirits. 
and you see Anthony has also made the, the headdress and the coat and when he is ready and spirits want it so he gets initiation and then he gets the snakes and the shaman name so in spirit of wolf is a big 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 difference because we in spirit of wolf if you join spirit of wolf you go on the path of the role of the shaman so you don't uh, you are not uh, involved in a hobby or or just um, without responsibilities this way will uh, lead you and educate you to become maybe a shaman or not it can also not be it's not like you join spirit of wolf and then you get initiation it's not that simple um, some people take years before and and some people never never get initiation but they just work within the tradition and sometimes people get initiated in a tradition but are not shamans and get no shaman name this is also uh, possible. So a big difference between what we do and what we teach is that we bring back this profession of the shaman back in Europe. And this is very much different than using shamanic techniques, which is also very beneficial to this world. But we make this profession, uh, we bring this profession back in Europe. Now, when it comes to the ritual garb, I really don't think I can add too much more than what Miriam and Anthony talked about, is this is going to become something from the tradition that you're working with. If you're working with, like, Spirit of Wolf, they have a very specific way that they do uh, their spiritual garb, but there's also the organic component that's going to determine what it is and specific details about your spiritual wear. When it comes to me and my personal practice, what I have as far as my spiritual like items and what I wear during a ritual has been something that has been very organic and explorative because nothing of my shamanic garb is something I bought all at once. Uh, many of it is stuff that I have made, I have replaced, uh, stuff that just has memories to me, like the green robe I have. There is nothing special about that green robe. I bought it off Amazon and, I, and I'll admit it, I bought it off Amazon. But I have worn it during so many rituals. The first time I wore it was at the Midsummer Gathering, uh, the first Midsummer Gathering we ever had. And I've worn it at countless rituals since then. So now it has a story. Now it has purpose to me. And there's no book out there that says you have to wear a green robe during your certain rituals or anything like that. But now that green robe is important to me. Even though it's just an Amazon robe I bought, it has a story and a meaning. And that's another reason that shamanism is difficult to talk about is because it is a very personal spiritual experience. Uh, and so really it's going to be different for every single one of you out there but i do have a piece of advice here at the very end for you to help you along your way if you're interested in getting into this i highly recommend picking up a journal a handwritten journal preferably because it it's nice to have something tactile that you can touch and again there's this you know shamanism and, and shamanic tradition is normally an orally passed down thing and so even talking about it and putting it on the internet just feels slightly wrong at times. And so having a book is really nice. Uh, but this is a really good way to just, you know, write down your shamanic experiences and record it because it's a highly visual and again, personal experience. For instance, I'm gonna show you right here something I saw on one of my spirit walkings. This is how my myself, my soul, my mind interpreted the world tree when I was on a spirit walk. You know, I saw a purple ocean, I saw a golden tree, and you know, and at other times I've seen a field walking up to that same tree and so your mind's going to interpret these images in different ways and the more that you do trances and, and you do spirit walking the more these images become solid and more known to you and again these are personal to me i can't you know go on the internet and be like this is what the world trade looks like i saw it in my mind i had a trance and this is what it's like that is toxic shamanism toxic spirituality this is personal spirituality this is showing you hey i went into a trance i used shamanic techniques i saw these things isn't that cool? Wow, what did you see? Wow, that's a really inter interesting interpretation. Our minds are going to interpret what we see very differently in our spiritual experiences. And so having a journal to write down and draw what you see, I think is very important. Even if you're not a good artist, you know, like I've seen these things as well during, you know, deep trances slash meditation. So, you know, seeing different symbols. Okay, what do these symbols mean? Let's hunt down these symbols. Uh, you know, or maybe you do another trance and you see these symbols again. Um, you know, to some people it might sound like nonsense, but truly these are how you start building your stories and, and building your uh, your shamanic journey that's a lot this was a big episode and there's gonna be a lot more i talk about like you know i'm gonna release another video talking about my spiritual garb uh the story behind everything here even though that's a scary prospect um but you know it's one of those things where I, I i feel like we need to talk about it more because uh you know one of the things that anthony and miriam were telling me is that sh shamanism and to be a shaman is a dying art and what i'm learning more and more is that the Id identities of paganism across the world and, and shaman uh, shamanism and all these things they're dying off, and if we don't do do something to preserve
deserve them or have the conversation, uh, you know, they are going to continue to die. And, and just because shamanism is, is complicated and it's hard to talk about doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. Um, to me, it's all about respect. Can you respect the source material? Can you respect one another when you have a conversation? And so that's all I can ask of the universe. I, this video is not perfect. This video was very hard to make, but I hope it has been able to give you a starting point off in your research to figure out more about shamanism on your own. Please hop down and join in the conversation down below um, if you want to talk about shamanic practice and, and you know and just learn from one another. Uh, a huge shout out to Miriam and Anthony for helping me throughout this video, uh, helping me throughout the process, and of course sitting down and having that interview with me. Um, I'll leave a link down below wherever that in interview, full interview ends up. Uh, so thank you to you both. Um, I wouldn't be able to have done this without you, and I hope I was able to honor what you taught me in the brief times that we talked. Um, you can find me on Instagram. This is right now my main source uh where to find me and it is wolfpack healer one word um i try to share as much as i can um i'm not always good at it but i try to share good content <laughs> yeah and for me uh without spelling my whole name and everything around it it's uh best to just look for easy dear come and I think Jacob would be so nice to put it somewhere uh, uh, around where you are listening right now. <laughs> so uh, you can go to the Instagram and there you can find my website and there you can find Spirit of Wolf. Uh, but if you are very much interested in Spirit of Wolf and not in me or in Anthony, you can go to uh, uh, spiritofwolf.net to look for more info on the tradition. Oh, yes. And of course, you can also find Miriam and I talking about all things shamanism and healing on our podcast, which is called Woodwolf, which Jacob will also be so kindly to link in the description. You're asking a lot uh, of me right now. I got to link a few. Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, with that, thank you all so very much. Those names going down here, these are the amazing people that support this channel, that make sure I'm able to do this research and this work and make these contacts, come out here and film these things and edit it and all this stuff. So to all these people, thank you very much. If you wanna get your name in the credits, head down to Patreon. Uh, there is a tier that allows you to get your name in the credits here, along with a lot of other benefits, including our community Discord, live streams, early access videos, and the book supporter tier. Uh, so thank you to all these names. Thank you to everyone that watches this content. And until the haul, let's go.